Let's look at a couple of rotational system examples here to begin with. Um, I have here um, just a simple uh, rotational inertia sitting on some bearings. Now we can go ahead and assume that, say these are some journal bearings with um, a linear damping uh, coefficient B, so we have a constitutive relation for a torque applied as this inertia would spin, say, at some omega J um, would be equal to omega times the speed associated with the bearing, which in this case, if the um, supports are fixed, then the velocity uh, that we associate with the bearing is going to be equal to uh, the velocity of the inertia, right? So we can say, right, from inspection that these two, excuse the cat be there, um, velocities that we would associate with the two elements in this simple system are equivalent. So let's look at a couple of different ways for working this problem. Um, let's say the first one, we're just gonna do a straight Newton's law approach, which if this was all you needed to do is to understand this little problem, this is the quickest way, right? And what you'd say is, well, the rate of change of the angular momentum, h dot, is, which is j omega dot j, is the sum of the torques and if you can see that in this system let's say it's spinning initially at omega sub j some initial value then the only torque uh, on this system uh, if we ignore windage say is the torque due to the uh, damper so really your equation would just be omega dot j uh, equals minus t sub b here um, and and then you'd, and you'd be done, and you know you'd say, oh well, that's minus b omega so b, and and so on, and you finish with that. Okay. Um, let's draw a graph for this, so you can see how it's associated um, with 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 this basic equation. Um, remember, if we have two elements that have the same velocity. That's a common angular velocity, so um, we can drop a one down there. Remember, I mentioned that whenever you have a, a mass or an either translational or rotational, you can associate that. So let me just say that I have this inertia. Oops. And you see, I I'm just using a word bond graph here that inertia has the velocity omega sub j and that's associated with this common junction but the reason we put this down there is so that we can also attach this bearing on here and we can say well by what we observe here they have the same velocity so graphically we can represent it this way remember that this one represents a couple different things. One, it represents that those velocities are equivalent. So you're making sort of a transformation of sort of your your physical understanding uh, into this graph here that represents the same thing. And also, each of these bonds has to have a torque on there, right? There's a torque here. We'll call that T sub J. There's a torque here, which we know is the torque on the bearing. So we already know that that T sub B is 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 equal to the torque on that bearing. What is this T sub J here? Well, that T sub J is just the inertial torque. It's just the H dot, right? So the system is represented with this graph here. This is not, this is what we call a word bond graph. It's not a complete graph, but it. Uh, my intent here is to have you begin using these so you can understand how these connections work. Um, we also can put sine on here, 
And what do we mean by sine? Well, we mean those half arrows, the power arrows. Remember the convention was um, that the power was positive in, but we don't do that. Um, we can change the arrows to associate with uh, the direction of power convention as we want it. And what we're going to always do is always point the power as being positive, right, into elements such as inertias and bearing. So I'm going to go ahead and show you that. Okay, if I put power bonds, power, sorry, if I put power arrows pointing each of, into these, these elements, what it's saying is that the power is positive, the convention is positive flowing into the inertia or in, you know, into the bearing and then out into heat. Now I've got equations that I can, that basically this is representing. What this is saying is um, that, that that torque is um, equal and opposite to this because remember that, that this one junction also represents the fact that the sum of the torques there equals to zero, right? So th this one represents a couple of th different things, right? It, it says that omega j equals omega v, but it also says that the sum of torques is equal to zero. So let's see that that sign uh, makes sense here. Remember, if they're positive in, then um, I can just write this as they're, now they're 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 pointing out, so I write minus t sub j, right? Because they're pointing in the opposite direction. Minus t sub b, that one's also out. That has to equal to zero. Well, what this says then, right, is that t sub j is equal to minus t sub b, and that's exactly what we wrote over here, right? T sub j is just h dot equals minus t sub b. Okay. Very simple example, but I wanted to illustrate how you can capture the correct sign convention. And what you'll begin doing then is, trans instead of thinking of the equations this way, you can begin transforming a schematic like this into a graph this way. For a simple problem like this, it may not look like it makes any sense, but as soon as systems get more complex, it can be a very uh, efficient way to write equations. In addition to that, once you've built this really simple graph, it makes it very easy to add additional elements. So let's say I also add on here a source of torque. Let's say that I was uh, also putting, sorry, also putting a torque on here that was an input, okay? How would you model that? Okay, let's go back to our original problem here. Well, uh, you would just say, okay, well, my h dot is my sum of torques, and originally that was minus t b, but now I'm not I'm I'm, a, I'm adding to the velocity, so I'm going to add a t sub t. That would be a very quick way to do that. On the graph, you would just add because you're applying that torque at at the velocity, right at the velocity of of the inertia, you can put a power bond here and say, oh, here's my source. And it's providing power, so it's going to be positive power into the one, and here's my T of T. See? So now you've captured graphically exactly what you have here. And I hope you can see that that arrow is coming in, and that would be a positive T here. So, so you see you've graphically have captured here the same thing that you had over here. Okay? And you've shown how you can add another element here. Right. One last example to show you we basically have the same system here, an inertia spinning on a fixed bearing. I have B, I have an applied torque, so I've got this omega J here moving as before. Right? The velocity of the bearing, fixed support, again, is equal to omega sub j. But now I'm adding a spring, and that spring is grounded over here, right? So one side of that spring is zero, the other is moving at omega j. So I have a spring here that has the same velocity of twist, right, the twist velocity, as the inertia. So remember what our original graph looked like. 
Well, actually, let's start off. How would you do this Newton's law? Well, h dot is minus t sub b from the bearing plus t sub t of the torque. And now you have another, you know, just the way the bearing is opposing the motion, at least in the positive, in sorry, in the sign convention we have, the bearing is opposing the momentum of the mass, of the inertia. The spring will also have a minus t sub k here. And if this is a linear spring, then we know what that torque is as a function of the uh, angular uh, twist of that spring. So we would have to have another equation for that guy. But um, this would be one equation. We know how to write that term. This is an input. This guy right here, uh, t sub k, is just k times theta, right? And what is theta? Well, I, I would have to find that state for that spring. Well, it turns out that because one side is grounded, I know that the rate of change of theta, right, is just omega of the spring, which is equivalent to omega sub j, right? So if I use omega sub j as my state or h, then I can just write that in terms of a state. And I would have two state equations, right? I'd have h dot for the h state, and I'd have theta dot for the theta state. Okay. The graph for this follows from what we, the one we had just done before. I have a single velocity here, a bearing. Here's my inertia. Here's my spring. All connected at the same. Remember, the arrows all power flows out from here, but it comes in from my source. So here's my TAT. Four elements now have been connected, all having the same or common velocity associated with that inertia, right? And you can see that the torques on each of these bonds have to sum to zero. And you can show that you get basically from this equation is the same as that there. Right? So graphically, this is what you've captured. Okay. And by the spring being on the same one, uh, on this one junction, the common angular velocity junction, this spring velocity here, you can see how since they're connected to that one, you should be able to see, right, in the graph that omega k is equal to omega j, and that gives you your second equation. Right? This is not exactly how we're leaving out several steps in how we're going to use a bond graph, but again, this is an intermediate step that will hopefully get you used to building graphs of systems and associating what you draw graphically with the equations.